Hello, everyone. It is now one o'clock, and we are here to continue our discussion of Great Expectations, our nine-month uh, exercise in reading slowly, because reading matters, as Rick has, has told us. Um, but for many of you, I'm, I'm certain this is a rereading experience. And I don't know about you, but I have greatly enjoyed this chance to reread a novel that I love and have taught and uh, feel that I know. But I always, when I, when I reread a novel, uh, especially one by as good a writer as, as Dickens, I see new things and I have new ideas. And so uh, rereading is, is really a wonderful experience. And it's good to do it in small doses because that way you don't have to remember everything that you read. And you know you may have read it weeks or months ago or years ago or whatever. But anyway, I, I have just finished for today's meeting rereading the section um, that was assigned, that is assigned for today's uh, meeting. And uh, um, I'm, I'm in San Francisco, and uh, I want to welcome all of you to uh, this session, yeah. January 2024 session um, of uh, the Pickwick Club, uh, which is organized by the Dickens Project in Santa Cruz. And uh, we uh, ha have been doing this now for several years, not as long as Rick and his San Francisco group have been running their small groups, but um, uh, we read one or two or three Dickens novels slowly during the year. And this year we happen to be reading the novel that will be featured at this summer's Dickens Universe. So this is a good preparation for those of you who uh, will be coming to uh, to that event at the end of July. And uh, today is a football day, and so I, I'm I'm sort of stalling for a few minutes to uh, make sure that everybody gets in to the Zoom link. I want to wish you a happy new year because uh, this is our first meeting of 2024. And uh, I, I also um, am pleased that we have a lineup of um, discussion leaders for the rest of, of our Great Expectations meetings. And today's facilitator, today's discussion leader, is Barb Rainey, who's um, from Santa Cruz. And uh, I, will, I will turn things over to Barb and let her take it from here. So Barb, thank you. And the floor is yours. Thanks. Well, um, just a little bit about myself. Um, as I tell my students, I've been teaching for a thousand years. I have taught um, in three countries, six states, eight high schools, two community colleges, and three universities. So, and I currently teach at Cabrillo College in Aftos. And I have taught Great Expectations, Hard Times, and Christmas Carol many times. Uh, oh, and the the story, the ghost story about the tunnel. I have tried to fit that one in a lot of times when I don't have enough space in my curriculum to get a Dickens full thing in. So I've been going to the Dickens universe since 1987. Um, I I think that's about it. Okay, uh, let's look at my little agenda for today. First slide there. Sorry, pulling it up now. Um, are you able to see that? Yes. Great. Yes. Yes. So I thought we'd start by you know, figuring out where we are in the story and then talk about what being a grown-up is <laughs> and then what 
PIP has learned. And then I have some things about different topics, home and uh, humiliation, and guilt. And then if there's time, talk a little bit about um, Dickens' craft and how he does it. So we can uh, we can you can take that away and let's try for this okay to not use the raise hand function and let's talk a little bit about where are we in the story now okay. What is Pip currently doing in the part that we read for today? Did Go you ahead. want to just jump in, Barb? Sure, let's jump in for this one. Um, I mean, it seems to me like he's visiting, he's, he's seeing how people live. He's going around to different places. He's going to to Wemmick's house and he's going to Jagger's house and then he goes back to Miss Havitham's house and he's just sort of observing all these different types of lives. The only house he doesn't go to in the section is Joe's house. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. We're going to talk about that. So what's he, what is, what's he learned or what, what's he, what, where is he in his stages of trying to figure out what's going on. <laughs> well, we've got the scene with uh, Joe coming to London, which is a pretty big uh, scene. We've got the scene with um, Pip going back home and overhearing the convicts talking. What else? I thought the uh, conversation between Pip and Miss Havisham in this uh, penultimate chapter, I guess it was, was especially powerful. Um, we're seeing more of what Miss Havisham's agenda is. Love her, love her, love her. Mm -hmm. yeah that's really good because we you know our pip and our first reaction to going there is what the heck is this you know it's all very confusing but you're right i think it's now starting to make some sense to us and to him as well Joe comes to visit Pip. Yes. How does that advance the plot, do you think? Well, it tells you a little more about Pip and how he's behaving towards people now that he thinks he's, you know, somebody or going to be somebody. And uh, the way he treats Joe, both in that visit and then when he returns home to see Miss Havisham and he doesn't even stop by to see Joe. Hmm. Yeah. That's quite significant, I think. Go ahead. I think it also tells us something about Joe and just how perceptive Joe is about what's going on with Pip. He's, he's too kind and too polite to say so, but it tells us a lot about, you know, just, you know, the, Joe, Joe was not the bumpkin that Pip would like to portray him. Yeah, that that whole speech, his apology, which is, uh, I've got the page number in my book, but um, is very, very well crafted. And we should probably look at that when we yeah, talk about. I'm having trouble hearing you. Could you speak up, please? Okay, I'll try. I'm all the way up as loud as I can go. Um, that last speech where he's apologizing for coming to London and how he is out of place. Uh, 
Well, let's do look at it, okay? I have a really funky book. It's on 224 in the Penguin. Okay, good. Would somebody read it, please? Could you give a chapter yeah. for those oh. of us who have a different book? All right. Just a chapter would help. We can find chapter it. Chapter eight of book two. Chapter eight, book two, or eight chapter eight. 27. Or chapter 27. Yeah. If we have the other numbering system. And it's right at the end. Near it's the end. very end. Yeah. Somebody read it, please. John has read that first part so many times. <laughs> Every Dickens universe, right, John? Mm -hmm. Right. I I love this this speech. And so I'd be happy to read it once I find Please the do. passage in my um, in my edition. So I'm. It's this is the the last two paragraphs of yes of, of chapter twenty seven, mm -hmm. um, and it begins Pip, dear old chap. And this is uh, I'll I'll begin right before that. Our eyes met, and all the sir melted out of that manly heart as he gave me his hand. Pip, dear old chap, life is made of ever so many partings welded together, as I may say, and one man's a blacksmith, and one's a white smith, and one's a goldsmith, and one's a coppersmith. Divisions among such must come, and must be met as they come. If there's been any fault at all today, it's mine. You and me is not two figures to be together in London, nor yet anywhere else, but what is private and been known and understood among friends. It ain't that I am proud, but that I want to be right, as you shall never see me no more in these clothes. I'm wrong in these clothes. I'm wrong out of the forge the kitchen or off the meshes. You won't find half so much fault in me if you think of me in my forge dress with my hammer in my hand or even my pipe. You won't find half so much fault in me if supposing as you should ever wish to see me, you come and put your head in at the forge window and see Joe the blacksmith there at the old anvil in the old burnt apron sticking to the old work. I'm awful dull, but I hope I've beat out something nigh the rights of this at last. And so God bless you, dear old Pip, old chap. God bless you. I had not been mistaken in my fancy that there was a simple dignity in him. The fashion of his dress could no more come in its way when he spoke these words than it could come in its way in heaven. He touched me gently on the forehead and went out as soon as I could recover myself sufficiently, I hurried out after him <clears throat> and looked for him in the neighboring streets, but he was gone. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. Of course, I, I can't do the accent properly, but I tried to get some of the. It was, ex it was excellent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, in, it's interesting how, how Joe has it so clearly. He knows exactly how he should behave. And Pip is so conflicted, like he, he, he's not sure how to behave. And when he goes back to visit, uh, he starts thinking, I need to visit Joe. And then the minute Estella tell, tells him, you won't be able to associate with the same kind of people that you did before, he changes his mind right away. So, yeah. Yeah. I, he he hurried after Joe, but I really this is don't think he hurried very fast. Well, he writes it says he hurried after him, but well, he yeah. says it seems I recovered Joe myself. I mean, there's a hesitation there um, to wait yeah. and then hurry. Not exactly a decisive moment. Yeah, right. I mean, Joe didn't just run away. I'm sure he just. <laughs> 
I mean, he's done that before. Pip is, uh, you know, when he left the forge, he kept saying, I'm going to go back and do it the right way, but he never does it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what does this, sorry, go ahead. I, w I was just thinking that he was, that Pip was very distracted by the message that he did get from, from Joe. You know, he, he's already thinking about when he's going to go back uh, to visit Miss Havisham. And it just shows you where his priorities are now. He's easily, easily distracted by the idea of going back there, but only for one reason. Yeah, yeah. And and we know, we know, because we are in Pip's mind, we already know how embarrassed of Joe he is. He has a lot of fear of Joe coming to London to Barnes Inn, and and he, we are set up to know that he's being a pompous little person. <laughs> oh, I think it it says that he had to recover himself. I think he really feels. I mean. Uh, he really realizes how great Joe is. I think he's slightly ashamed of himself there. You know, he's touched by by Joe's speech. Was just, you know, Joe is so genuine and so real. Um, I think he was really emotionally uh, touched by by that speech, and I think that's the, what the hesitation was. He was upset, you know. He's tearing up, and then then he runs out after him, but he's too late. I think it's interesting to think about the words that Joe uses in the speech where he uses the word right and wrong several times. Mm -hmm. He says like, I want to be right. And I was, you know, I was like, what does that mean? What does that mean in his mind like to be right? But someone just used the word that I think I was looking for, which is genuine. Like he wants to be who he is. He doesn't want to pretend to be something else. You know, the way Pip mm -hmm. is striving so hard to do. And he, and he understands like it's wrong to try to, for him anyway, it's wrong to try to be someone other than who he is. And I, I, I imagine that Joe did not want to be found either afterwards. You know, there was probably hesitation on the part of Pip. And I think there was a hurried probably behavior on the part of Joe. It, it, he was firm. It wasn't going to happen again, although we, it does later, but that he wasn't going to meet him in in London. It just it just wasn't. It just wasn't right for all kinds of reasons. So are we marking down that one of the things that he's advancing the plot here is he we have more he has more understanding of the fact that he's um not being a very nice person, <laughs> feels guilty for what he has done. Mm -hmm. Perhaps. Well, is there any? I have one off the out of kilter thing that I wanted to bring up because nobody's brought it up before. Um, Ava, if you'd give the, I think it's the second slide. Yeah, we didn't talk about Chatham, um, Rochester, or Medway at all. And um, this is just about the passage that we see Pip going to London by land, but you can go as the introduction to the book, you know, has reference to that. You can go out the Medway and up the, the Thames from, this is just a picture of what the Dr. Ch Chatham looked like in uh, 1790. But um, we haven't really talked too much about that. Anybody want to add to that? Okay. I had I have some more things to say about the passage. Good. Um, one thing 
is that it, it's important to read the passage all the way to the end of the, the chapter because you get the juxtaposition of two voices. You, you get the juxtaposition of Joe's voice with the voice of Pip. And it's, you have to remember always that it's Pip the narrator. This is Pip telling the story in the past tense as he remembers the event. So the voices here are Pip, we, we haven't, you know, in our reading, we haven't gotten to the end of the book, so we don't quite know what who Pip is at that point. We'll we'll find out. But we're learning a little bit about Pip, the older Pip who tells the story, by the way that he tells the story. So we, we also there are two voices. Sorry. And the the voice, the voice of Joe um doesn't have very many um, mispronunciations or grammatical mistakes. It's it's not, uh, but it's it's not standard English, and Pip's narrator voice is always grammatically correct. And so uh, you're you're juxtaposing here uh, an, an accent that is specific to Joe, and uh, that reflects his origins, his background, the kind of work that he does. Uh, many things about Joe are expressed through the language that that he uses and that Pip gives to him. Um, and that 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 juxtaposition is part of the this what Dickens is is wanting us to pay attention to. Well but also remember we have that wonderful juxtaposition of Pip being taught not to use the knife as a fork and yep. Pip, Pip being in that position of being the country bumpkin and then now we've got Joe being the country bumpkin and, and uh, once again Dickens can point that out as John is saying with the with the use of syntax and grammar and everything which we all know is what he's good at yeah. And then just one, one other thing to say about Joe's speech is that Joe is a has a poetic way of expressing things. And you remember from early in the book that Joe wrote a, a little couplet to put on his father's tombstone. Remember, reader, he were that good in his heart. Mm -hmm. um, I, I can't quote the whole uh, passage, but uh, Joe sometimes has a poetic way of expressing himself, and I think in in this passage in particular, and it's it's one of my favorite passages in all of Dickens. He he starts off by saying, "Life is made of ever so many partings welded together," and what 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 does that mean? What is what does it mean to say life is made of ever so many partings welded together? And why is that poetry? Uh, Blair? Can I be heard? Yes. Good, because my microphone's not very good. Um, regarding Joe's uh, speech, the original people reading the, uh, reading this, when it first came out, would they have seen Joe as being authentic or, which is my interpretation, or would they have seen him as knowing his place? What do you think? I don't really know. I was just uh, depending on the expertise of the room to help me answer that. What do other people think? We had somebody else. Rick has his hand raised as well. Oh, let's see him. There we go. Yes. Um, talking about Joe, if you look at uh, page 221, where Joe arrives at the dinner, he has 
he has a lot of business with his hat, recall? Yes. <laughs> and he's looking all over for a suitable spot on which to deposit his hat, as if it were only on some very few rare substances in nature that it could find a resting place, and ultimately stood it on an extreme corner of the chimney piece from which it ever afterwards fell off at intervals. And he kept picking it up and putting it back. He didn't move it anywhere else. He felt like that was where he wanted it. And he didn't seem at all embarrassed, did he, about the fact that his hat kept falling off. And what, you know, what does it tell you about Joe? The hat scene. I really want to know. Because I thought it was quite odd. I, if I were a, a shy person and some way felt inadequate in a situation, I I surely wouldn't do all that stuff with my hat. <laughs> I, I, I think he was aware even before uh, Pip was embarrassed by the way Joe was dressing. And maybe Joe felt that to dress appropriately for the occasion, he needs to have a hat but he didn't really know, he wasn't used to a hat and he didn't know how to use it. So it, it was awkward. Yeah, and there's a great passage on 222, a short one that sort of addresses that, Rick. Um, I had neither the good sense nor the good feeling to know that this was all my fault. And that if I had been easier with Joe, Joe, Joe would have been easier with me. I felt impatient of him and out of temper with him. In which condition he heaped coals of fire on my, in which condition he heaped coals of fire on my head. Now I'm not sure what that last bit means, but I think Pip is acknowledging that the anxiety that Joe's feeling that comes out with all the business with the hat is his fault. And he hasn't been able to smoothly integrate Joe into his home at all. Mm. Is Joe sending a signal on purpose? No, I don't think so. I, I think no. He, no, I think he's just very, he's very anxious. He's ill at ease. Um, he isn't getting any help. You know, I imagine Pip's probably kind of standoffish and he's very overdressed. Uh, both of them are overdressed. Let's put it that way. Um, I would say especially Pip. <laughs> <laughs> It, it seems like the hat is is Joe actually. Um, yeah, I think so. He just doesn't fit in. He, it's uh, just Dickens. Dickens giving us another clue that he he's just really awkward and doesn't fit. He doesn't have. There's no place for him to fit in that particular scene. So it's kind of like a little bit of a of symbolism. Like, I think it's different. good that he that he or it's emblematic of it that you know he he doesn't change though. He doesn't try to find another place to put it or so forth he that's his that's joe that corner and he knows yeah. that's his corner he doesn't and what we were talking about joe that he knows who he is he's yeah or that he has one way of being you know so uh, jordan said before uh, he talked about the poetic words and right he had a question about the poetic why is it poetic when uh, joe gives his speech so the words uh, 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 that he uses, as Jordan said, is the uh, Pip, the teller of the story. But mm -hmm. the actions that Pip tells, even they start before the door opens, how he goes slowly, like clumsily on the stairs and how it takes him time to check the name. So when he describes the actions, even before he enters the room and then with the, with the head, he describes as Joe is really, but when he puts words into Joel, the words are probably the narrator's words. Hmm. <coughs> Rick? Yeah. Uh, I should take my hand down. I mean, you're dealing with my question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I got to take my hand down. <laughs> so I've got to Karen. Yeah. Um, I wanted to go back to your question, John, about this quote and what it actually means and just what it means to me life is made of ever so many partings welded together what i have found this quote to be is extraordinarily comforting and meaningful to people to share in the midst of grief 
and grieving. Um, we are all of us part and parcel of what, who we experience over the course of a lifetime. And even in a person's absence, like Joe is going to be absent now from PIP, um, they're in our hearts. They're welded. It's embedded in our hearts. And it's just an incredibly, in so few words, I just find it such an absolutely incredibly strong comfort about loss and grief for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What is a parting? It's what did you say? I didn't hear that. What is a parting? You've well, told us that before, word, John. Yeah. What does the <laughs> word mean? It's the little bits that uh, come out when they the blacksmith uh, hammers the uh, horseshoe or whatever he's making and flies off. With. Probably not a horseshoe. Okay. <laughs> Something bigger. I, I just want to go back to what um, Karen said. Um, you know, I, I went to a funeral yesterday, and um, one of the things that several people who spoke emphasized was that uh, they will be happy to be connected once again to the man who died once they are in heaven. And um, I, I think there's that this passage means a little bit of that as well. Karen's beautiful comment is is an observation about the meaning of this in much larger terms. Mm -hmm. And and I think you're right to bring up funerals as. as a context for this. Yes. Well, and we already know yeah. from, from the beginning of the very beginning of the novel, Pip is haunted by all the deaths in his family. Mm -hmm. So uh, the partings as funereal possibly is certainly resonant with what we've already, the way the novel begins. Yeah. And I, and I think the reference in the last paragraph, when he refers to the fashion of his dress, could no more come in its way than it could come in its way in heaven, is another reference to. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. David has his hand raised. David? David. Uh. Joe uses lots of images from his work. Mm -hmm. And I think the image here is of a chain, which at that point would have been made one link at a time with the link, each link welded together after it's looped around the previous link. So he's seeing life as one long chain of connections. And similar to the last line of the first paragraph there, the, I hope I beat out something nigh the rights of this. Um, you know, you, you beat on the metal and make it the right form, make it into what it is supposed to be or what it needs to be. And the pain of, for me is that they are friends, that they are connected. And Joe understands that, except here in London, they're not. And there's this dissonance that goes on between personal lives and public lives. And I'm just thinking about if I'm Pip and I go to Wemmicks for dinner, that's weird. Uh, if I go to Jagger's for dinner, that's weird. People who have these personas that change in different situations and you, how do you how do you how do you behave it's just so confusing mm -hmm. um and joe seems to understand and is more honest than anybody else about how this can work and it's so 
physical for him and it's so practical for him uh, to use that metaphor of his work. It's it's beautiful. And I, I think that's what I think that's what Pip is sorting out as we see in the in the in the chapters here in this section is how do you behave? You know, how he's trying to learn how to behave, you know. Uh, he's already, you know, kind of in shock at how shoddy London is and the people he's coming in touch with. And um <clears throat> yeah. So Joe uh, Pip doesn't want to behave like Joe, but he he wants to learn more, but he's he's unsure at this point. Well, Estella's already told him that his boots are coarse and then his whole all, all of his dress and everything is not suitable. So he he he's well set up to know that he's not, you know not right. Why is Joe in London? Why? Oh, the play. So the play. Hey. Because he, I thought it was to bring yeah. him the. Oh, yeah. oh, to tell him that Miss Avisha wants to see him, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's that's the reason. What other reason does Joe have for coming to London? He accompanied the the guy who played became an actor, right? Mm -hmm. Wapsle. Yeah. Yeah. Wapsle. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. What other reason does Joe have for coming to London? I'm I'm sorry. I'm I'm going <laughs> to pound on this question for a little while. Well, he's coming to see Pip for sure. And why is he coming to see Pip? Well, hasn't hasn't Biddy suggested that he come to see Pip? Uh, Biddy said he should. Yes. And why else is Joe coming to London? Because he cares about uh, Pip and wants to see how he's doing. And, and why else? Him. It, it sounds like he's establishing the future relationship. Like he says, I understand that you need to separate from me. The letter that Biddy writes to tell that he's coming is also interesting because she she uh, makes a point uh, for Pip to remember how kind and wonderful Joe is. In the letter that Biddy writes, uh, the P.S. I think is pretty significant. Yeah. Uh, he wishes me most particular to write what larks. Uh, yeah. Repeated. Um, that's that's the deep affection. Yeah. There's another little phrase that Joe and Pip have together. They they have a number of, you know, what larks. Um, the other phrase that I'm remembering is ever the best of friends. Mm -hmm. Right? Yep. So why is Joe coming to London to visit Pip? He's coming for one reason, because... Uh, he has a message to bring, which is a message from Miss Havisham. And that, as we know, is a very, very important message for Pip because it, it, it means to come back and see the person he thinks is the benefactor um, for his great expectations. Well, like, well you know, okay. connection to Estella, too. I mean, it's... it's and the connection to Estella. Yeah. You know, Pip, Pip, Pip is still always thinking about Estella and Miss Havisham is the connection between Pip and Estella. But what is it that Joe knows something that Pip doesn't know because Joe is older and wiser than Pip. He may not be as well educated, but he knows things emotionally. He knows things of the heart that Pip young Pip doesn't understand. For example. I, I, th I think Pip is, excuse me, I think Joe is coming to London to say goodbye to Pip. Mm. Why do you say that? 
I think he missed him. I think he missed Pip. Um, of course he does. But I don't, I think he's there to say, ever the best of friends. I will always love you, no matter what. I don't see the goodbye. I don't see the goodbye. The goodbye is the parting. The partings are the little bits of chain that, you know, links of like. that pick up a, up a, cha up a chain. Mm -hmm. um, partings are death, but partings are also goodbyes. Mm -hmm. And I think Pip, Pip has moved beyond the world of Joe's experience into the world of being a gentleman of London, of, uh, you know, all of these things that, that Pip associates with his future, not with his past. And I think Joe understands that this may be, may be the last time he will ever see Pip. And he's come to London to deliver a message that is important for Pip. He loves Pip. We know he loves Pip. That's, that's ever the best of friends. But there, there's a sadness in ever the best of friends. Because Pip is ashamed of his connection with Joe. And Joe knows that at a deeper level than Pip understands it. And, and so Joe has come to say, this may be the last time that we'll ever see each other. Life is made of ever so many partings. That, that, that welded means- together. You know, Welded together, welded together, welded together. When we say goodbye today, we have hope to see each other again uh, a month from now. No, I, I know. <laughs> not going there. I, with you. <laughs> I, I think. Okay. I, think I, 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 I think John's other, reading other is. Come, come, I think John's come. reading is an extra poignancy, and that it might ex, might you know motivate the, the use of the metaphor of like partings, you know, because. You know that that it. I don't know. I, I I tend to I tend to agree with John. I think that I think that uh, that okay. Joe Joe realizes that Pip is like drifting away, and that he may not see him again. And that he for for Joe, uh, uh, relationships are are sort of like permanent. They're almost the the only relationships Joe seems to know are like familial relationships, really close, intimate familial bonds, and. Uh, and in you know it's a shock to, it's a shock to him that Pip is moving away anyway so the so the anyway so but I yeah I, I kind of tend to agree with John it, it the the idea that that Joe sees Pip moving away you know permanently is just lends a, a, an extra poignancy to the to the the idea of, you know the the idea of partings why would he talk about partings otherwise. Yeah. And is the allusion, the inclusion of Hamlet here significant? I mean, that's a, mm -hmm. there are plenty of Shakespearean plays you could draw on, but the wrestling with the loss of a father figure, I don't know, that could figure in. Mm -hmm. Parting is sweet sorrow. Yeah. But parting is such sweet sorrow is a phrase that implies that there will be a reunion later on. Yes. But what if there's what if there's not going to be another reunion? I mean, Joe is not going to stop loving Pip, mm -hmm. but Pip might stop loving Joe if he goes on into this world of being a gentleman. And at the very at the very end of the chapter, said when, as soon as I recover myself sufficiently, I hurried out after him. That tells me that Pip realizes something about what's going on. There, there, for me, there are two, I, I'm talking a lot about this passage, but it means a lot to me. Uh, there are two ways to read that ending, I think. One is that Pip is very moved by the speech that, that Joe gives because Joe touches him and Joe, Joe actually, before he leaves, he touches him with his hand. Mm -hmm. And I think Pip feels that love and that friendship. 
Um, and there are two ways to read the final paragraph. One is that Pip is so touched, so moved by it that he he he's immobilized for a minute. He has to stop and think about it. But another way to read it is is that Pip, if you if you felt touched by Joe, why didn't you embrace him? Why didn't you say, Joe, I love you. I will always love you. And so Pip hesitates and then gives Joe enough time to get lost in London and then goes outside and can't find him. So, so there's a, there are two ways to, to read it. And I think the ambiguity of that is one of the richness is part of the richness of this of this passage and and that makes it poignant ernest wanted to say something oh yeah well i agree completely with that but I, and the other thing i want to say is joe kind of leaves in his statement he says in private though we could get along just fine like and that's kind of an opening to pip for you know I'm not saying goodbye permanently here necessarily, but in private with the eyes of the world not looking at us, we could have larks and have fun together again. If you come back to the forge and look through the window and see me, but I don't think Joe is saying, I'm going to come back to London regularly to visit you <laughs> in London. No. Because Joe feels wrong and out of, out of place and he knows he's out of place in london he can't find a place for his hat in london well there's a commonality to that too haven't we all gone someplace wearing something that was uncomfortable or not suited to us or made us feel unattractive or overweight or whatever and I, there's a very nice commonality to that hat thing. And we, we've all been there one way or another, I think. Um, would you guys indulge me? Go ahead. <laughs> uh, yeah, finish your idea, John. I... Um, about, I, I, I'm just, I, I'd like to have a little bit more discussion about the hat. Okay. Is, is. Is is the first of all, why why is Joe why does Joe not know what to do with a hat? Including one. And we we had a request from over the chat that if there, there's someone who has a little background noise that gets yeah. in the way of people hearing. So uh if you do have background noise please please mute your um, yourself but anyway my my question i'm sorry i <laughs> i love this passage uh, oh what do you do with a hat i mean let's talk about that meg has her hand raised meg oh it's it's a margaret and uh i would like to go back to the parting the last chapter that we were talking about and nobody raised the idea of parting as death and i see in that speech that that joe gives to pip a a parting to or the death of childhood and that he see a scene in his way that pip's pip's childhood is dead and that he is 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 go going into manhood and that is the major parting that he's talking about there and i'm i'm sorry i'd raised my hand before we were going to talk about the hat but i think of the the hat in the writing of charles dickens as a great vaudeville sketch and that i believe i've seen it in vaudeville and or in uh, in movies like the marx brothers the uh, concentration on one <clears throat> particular object or one uh, one thing to deflect what's really going on, <laughs> you know, that, that that life and death things are going on, but still there's the hat. And uh, anyway, I just wanted to introduce the hat 
as the your the idea of a vaudeville sketch. So thanks. That's all I have to say. Thanks. Both are very good observations. Um, I think that Joe's statement, life is made of ever so many partings welded together, is a very profound statement about life. That we go through life and, and we lose people. We lose friendships. We lose parents. We lose friends. If you think about it, that's that's a description of what it's like to, to live. And, and Pip has had deaths of both parents and deaths of all his siblings and uh, I mean, the the novel is is full of death from the very beginning and uh, so Joe's statement is a statement both about Pip and Pip's experience and about everyone's experience. Barb just went to a funeral yesterday. Uh, I, I had three good friends die in the last few months. Um, life is is full of partings. And every time you say goodbye to someone, that's a parting. And it's a an anticipation in its very small way of that parting that may be the last one. Um, I, I hate saying goodbye to people. I, I, I like to say, see you next time. Uh, uh, there's in, in there's another reference to parting. When Joe uh, first comes and he has his hat, he said he wouldn't hear of parting with this piece of property. <laughs> the word parting and variations on it are a crucial word in this novel. Keep keep that in mind as you as you read forward and as you go back and read again. Um, and think about the multiple ways in which partings as death, as goodbyes, as separations resonate ac across this, this book. But the idea of Joe's hat as vaudeville, as low comedy, I think is also a wonderful observation. Didn't you think that the hat bit was funny? Didn't yeah. you think it was funny? Yes. And once again, but also, yeah, go ahead. Once again, very realistic. What what happens when you take a hat to something? You go to a <laughs> concert or something outdoors, and you have to wear a hat because it's sunny. And then, what do you do with it? I mean, it it, it hats are are problems. Period. Unless you go someplace where there's a hat rack <laughs> but you know we all have i think some comedy routine we've done with a hat right what do you do with a hat on an airplane yes exactly but yeah you no know, it is an, a comedic observation which back to what john is saying is the the, the man is wonderful at doing this sort of stuff um, could you guys indulge David, me? David, David has his hand up, so we should, we should acknowledge people. You're muted, David. You're muted. Joe so rarely wears a hat that he doesn't know what to do with it. Uh, what you did if you were a gentleman calling was very often you put the hat on the floor and put your gloves into the hat and that got them out of the way and then you put them up when you were ready to leave. And Joe hasn't even seen anybody do this. Rick? Yes. Um... Pip came to London to become a gentleman. And he's got a whole lot of people around him he's meeting and dealing with and so on and so forth. And I wonder if he defines any of them really as a gentleman according to the model that he has in mind. And what does he really think a gentleman is? The way these people behave at the dinner table, I can't understand necessarily that any of them are a gentleman. 
I mean, there's wrangling and, you know, complaining and putting each other down and all of this kind of stuff. Who Who is the gentleman for him to model after at this point? Or does he really have one? And does he go looking for gentlemen? We talked about this last time quite a bit. The, you know, who, who is truly gentle with others, and we we kind of decided that Herbert was maybe one of them. We talked about that last time. Does he seem to evaluate his own progress in becoming a gentleman by any standards? Well, Estelle would be his uh, executor of standards, right? And when he gets back in touch with her, she's not very, um, doesn't deem him to be worthy, right? She's just as vain toward him as she always was. Hands up. Hands up. Okay. Uh, Rick, are you done? Or you yeah, got I'm trying to figure out how to get my hand down again. Down below. Okay. <laughs> Glenna. I was just going to say, how does Pip know about gauging himself on being a gentleman? Well, in a lot of ways, it's natively. If he distances himself from Joe, that's maybe, uh, and he's got so much anxiety on the subject. So he's it, his treatment of Joe is a mix of guilt and anxiety. Mm -hmm. Priscilla? That's good. I, I, had a, I had a question going back to the hat. <laughs> in, in the paragraph where it says, um, he puts it back on the mantelpiece after it fell off in the same exact spot, as if it were an absolute point of good breeding that it should tumble off again soon. <laughs> Pretty funny. Yeah. yeah. What, I'm not sure. I mean, I think I know what that means, but um, what do you think? I, the one question that follows from your very good question about the hat, and I think there's more to say about the hat, is okay. um, is is Pip making fun of Joe? Hmm. Is Dickens making fun of Joe? Are we laughing at Joe when we say that this is a vaudeville skit? Hmm. Are we making fun of Joe? Is Joe a clown? I well, so. I can chime in on that. I don't I don't see it that way. Um, I see this dual depiction of a comedic scene as engaging the reader into something far deeper. I think that hat is symbolic of adopting a piece of persona or a persona that is not you. It's fake. So you're never comfortable. It's never in the right place. It's not an integrated part of yourself. And so I think this is a very graphic depiction of Pip in a way, indirectly through the hat, because he's never comfortable on his own skin. He adapts. He always adapts a pseudo self. And we have this whole image of the hat being something that just doesn't fit with Joe. And he knows it. He doesn't know what to do with it. So it could also reflect just his, well, also reflects his anxiety about being in a situation in which he's not a fit. So it's that hat has so many layers to it in terms of how we can interpret it um, as a literary device, as a insight into both Joe and Pip's um, personalities and just the whole danger of adopting a fake persona to fit a situation in which you find yourself. Um, that's what I read in it. That's what I think that's wonderful. 
um, my first husband was in the Air Force. And when I went to join him, we had a lecture on how to wear gloves. And um, it was obvious that many people had never, ever worn gloves before, especially formal gloves. And people just did some amazingly atrocious things like stick a dip into chip with the, you know, with their gloves on. A very um, comedic, but uh, embarrassing, uh, kind of distressing, you know, uh, for sure. I Sorry. think um, the description of Joe and the hat is done affectionately. I don't think it's done uh, to make fun of him. Sarah? So if we accept that he came to say a final goodbye, he doesn't want to leave anything behind. And hats are items that we usually leave behind because the entire description is how he is holding it. He doesn't feel comfort comfortable putting it just putting it anywhere. Uh, so maybe he's just making sure that he's taking everything with him when he leaves. <laughs> that's that's a, a good practical consideration. <laughs> Clark? Uh, I, I think it's so I, I know. Yeah. Um, you know, he starts by making a joke about the way that Joe says architectural. Ha ha you know, Pip noting language again. Um, but then also Pip says, but you know, it's kind of an accurate depiction of some of the ar architecture I've seen too. So there's almost like a, it's a, he's laughing and joining in on the laugh, I think a bit. And um, he goes on then to describe <laughs> Joe's uh, adroit manipulation of the hat as it falls in a pretty positive way. He, he made extraordinary play with it. And showed the greatest skill. I mean, part of that, I think, is, um, wow, look at Joe move. At the same time, you might be kind of laughing at him. I, I can't help but think of Huck Finn. I know it's not a particularly apropos connection here, but a relationship between someone younger with someone older, someone who is more experienced but denigrated, and how the older, less uh, well-positioned character has a wisdom that the younger person doesn't have and there's a complicated relationship and making becoming aware of that and acknowledging it and feeling some guilt about treatment and uh i i think i, I this is a fantastic chapter <laughs> it's so <laughs> complicated uh so funny and so there's so much pathos that, that's exactly the combination i think that dickens is is achieving here it's funny and it's sad at the same time. It's painful to watch. The young Pip is embarrassed by the fact that Joe doesn't know how to, how to dress and how to talk. Um, and the older Pip perhaps is beginning to recognize that there's something genuine about Joe that is not true of the other people Bentley Drummle and uh, the pockets and this world that he wants to be part of. And he's trying to figure out where he stands in relation to Estella. It, it's, 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 it's very complicated mm -hmm. emotionally. And, and uh, it, it's, it makes it all the harder, I, I think, to capture the the right tone the right way to talk about about this interaction and i i agree it's a wonderful chapter well are we are we saying that um this his sort of realization of how he feels about joe it, is this part of the is he advancing as a, becoming a grown-up or as advancing in as becoming what he thinks he should be or what or is it he, both yeah 
You've got Sarah again. Yes. So I just want to to uh, uh, mention that we have a detail that we didn't uh, in this scene that I think is probably important that Herbert is there for the first part of the meeting yeah. and then he leaves. And Herbert is very natural with Joe. Uh, and, and, uh, and then uh, 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 Pip says, he, he, he is thankful for that, but he said, I guess if Joe was Herbert's guest, he wouldn't have behaved the same way. And this is also a very interesting thought. Mm -hmm. That's a good observation. Herbert is there for part of the meeting and Herbert is gone for part of the meeting. And Joe and Joe react to the fact to that fact. How yeah, it's interesting. Then yeah, it's very interesting. Priscilla. I was thinking back to the last paragraph when he says, May will I see you again? And he says, probably not. And I'm I'm thinking that. You know, when you when you when you understand where Dickens life was actually, you know, that it was extreme poverty. And sometimes I think maybe in his life, he was looking at the people in um, our lives who help us develop our character. And I think he is looking at Pip as I, I, I you know, he played a role in developing Pip's character. But now he sees where Pip is, and um, he understands that he played, he did his part well in developing Pip's character. But now Pip is in a different place. I don't know if that explains what I'm trying to say, but well, he is most like um, a, a parent. I mean, Mrs. Joe is not a particularly good parent material and uh, yeah and certainly the parenting does involve coming to that place where you have to let go right let mm -hmm. things go yeah mm -hmm. I don't know um can we talk about the homes I, Just, go ahead yes I, I was gonna say why don't why don't you move us on to some other topics and some other passages. Yeah, just for a moment, will you indulge me about something that I've um, been trying to figure out for the past three or four weeks? <laughs> and once again, um, anyway, what do we have to know in order to grow up? I'm 82 years old and I'm still trying to figure out the answer to that question. Me too. And I, you know, maybe we should go the, uh, well, we'll go see what people have to say and then we could go the other <laughs> direction. Um, so. Well, I agree. I'm 73. And so I, I think we learn by our mistakes. I think that's part of, of um, and you look back through your life at people you've come across who have influenced your life but maybe you knew you weren't going to choose their path. So, so uh, knowing a lot of mistakes helps us. That's uh, that's good. I I like that uh, character and wisdom. Yeah, David, you're muted, David. Got it. Okay, I'll take a stab at this. I'm the same age as John. Uh, I kept wondering at various points, like when I graduated from college, I thought I'm supposed to be grown up and know what I'm doing, and I don't. And I went on for the next 10 years or so. And I thought, well, I still don't know what I'm doing. 
but I've gotten this far without knowing what I'm doing, so maybe I can keep going. It's very difficult to define being grown up. I'd say it's taking responsibility for yourself, not expecting somebody else to take care of you, cleaning up after yourself, and achieving a certain comfort with who you are and where you are. Is that any help? Well, we then we all know several people, don't we, that have never grown up, but that's another <laughs> topic. Lena. <laughs> yeah. Um, I want to go back to the theme of partings. I think that um when you grow up, when you you acquire a certain tragic sense of life and you understand that the people you cherish you could lose at any moment, and therefore you have to treat them well and learn to forgive them and forgive yourself. I think um, if people don't ever acquire that concept of life as tragic and cherish and understand that any parting could be a final parting, um, then they could be uh, stuck in a state of frozen. Um, Infantilism. Yeah, that's really good. Sarah? So the way you, you asked the question, what do I need to know in order to grow? Yeah. Then I would say that I need to know that I don't yet know everything. Because the minute I, I think I know everything, I stop growing. Yes, yes. Um, famous philosopher says that too, right? Okay, Peggy. Yeah. Peggy. Peggy. You're muted, Peggy. And I'm just a little slow. I saw this saying in something I was just sort of reading by. It's supposed to be, I think, sarcastic or funny. And it was the essence of growing up is learning how to act in public. Mm -hmm. mm. Mm. Well, let's re reflect on the news of this week with that in mind, shall we? Um, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, that's interesting. Well, and we should we should note that Marilyn has put something in the chat. Know okay. that you are making a choice in your actions. So. Oh, there you go. That's a good one too. But once again, I think we all know people that have not achieved that, right? Um, well, where is Pip now? What does he know? How how has he grown? Is he taking responsibility? Uh, I mean, we just talked about how he um, feels guilt, some guilt for how he is, has treated Joe or how he has thought about Joe. Um, anyway, uh, go ahead, Sarah. So I thought, I thought, for example, uh, when when he visits uh, Miss Avisham and he realized that uh, what's his name, the guy that used to work in Orlick, Orlick, yeah, and he has enough courage to go to J Mr. Jagger and tell him he's not the right person for the job, mm -hmm. uh, uh, shows some some confidence, some growth, and then it's very interesting because Mr. Jagger said he is. That's the kind of people that we need for the job, people who are not suitable for the job, but he still uh, listens to Pip's recommendation, which also tells something uh, about how Jagger is trying to train him. So, yeah. so, yeah, there are a lot of interesting, interesting things like uh, in the dinner that they have at Mr. Jagger. Uh, he, he, 
yeah, yeah, it's a different subject, so I leave it now, but it's interesting. Yeah, yes, that's very good, I think. I I don't know. Uh, because remember that Pip uh, does realize after he's told Jagger that, he does realize that he could have, there could be serious consequences of his doing that. He knows that Orlick is a violent guy, right? And he does come to the moment of realization that by telling Jaggers that and getting Orlick in trouble, which he does, that it's dangerous. Ernest? Oh, well, yeah, and this is probably repeating things, but it's there's such a difference between, and this is where Pip is, in you know, kind of feeling what's right, the right thing to do or making a choice as to what the right thing or what to do or maybe the right thing, but then doing it. It's uh, kind of like all thought and not action uh, at this point. Uh, takes longer in the novel, a lot longer for him to really do something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Rick? Rick? Um if Jagger really thinks that he's suitable for the job, why does he go along in, in canon? I, I saw that because he's training him, so he wants to give him confidence. Like you made a suggestion and I listened to you. I, that's what I thought. It's part of his training, like be confident. If you have proposals, you can bring them up. <laughs> Well, uh, what does Jagger do, period? Uh, people are very afraid of him. Um, the dinner thing, we should probably just look at that. Uh, this is very odd. Um, what, what does he do? Rick? Oh, I'm... I'm confused now about that taking all the keeping all those people around the table <laughs> in order is a bit of a challenge for me but here i am leaving my hand up when i should take it down I, it's a, i'm gonna grow up i'm gonna remember how to take my hand down <laughs> <laughs> good sarah are you asking about the dinner that mr john we're, whatever you want to finish up on, I, that was just a thought that came into my head about that. Very yeah, strange. I I thought the dinner was interesting because Mr. Jagger, who everybody is afraid of and everybody looks up to, is hosting a dinner, and you expect the people who come for the dinner, who met him probably, other than Pip, everybody met him I think for or other than Herbert, they met him for the first. You 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 expect them to be in their best behavior. Yeah. But somehow, Mr. Jagger is able to make, to bring up the real people. Some, sometimes he somehow is able to set them loose in a way that he can learn exactly who they are. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Yeah. That's very good, Margaret. Yes, I'd, I'd like to go back to the uh, the idea of Pip taking responsibility for everything. And from the very beginning of the novel, it seems that he takes responsibility for his dead brothers in the graveyard and that he takes responsibility for the meeting with Magwitch and that he takes responsibility in the uh, in that last uh, chapter that we were discussing with Joe Joe's be behavior in uh, at that meeting and i think that part of uh, growing up is to realize that you're not the center of the universe and that pip that is pip's uh pip's cross that he has to carry throughout this novel is that he takes responsibility for everything the world result revolves around him after all he's the main character in in dickens in dickens uh concept of course and uh Everything does revolve around him, but part of growing up 
is is not thinking that you are the reason for why everything is happening. And I think to jump into the uh, the dinner with Mr. Jaggers is that that uh, Pip becomes he he acts out his different things with with the other students, and uh, that he kind of loses his his grasp on being the center of the universe, of being the main character in that scene. And that uh, one of the other things that's most interesting in the Mr. Jagger's dinner is, is Jagger's concentration on Bentley Drummle. And of course, we could discuss about why he is fascinated by this character and about all of the work that uh, Jagger's does as a, uh, as a lawyer. And uh, one of the things that I'd like to ask this group at some point is to discuss what, where Jaggers is in the legal system. You know, he seems to be defending the, uh, the accused. So he is a, a defending lawyer, but uh, again, there's a difference between the American legal system and the British legal system. So all of those things could be discussed, I think uh, in the near future. But um, anyway, that point, the main point I wanted to make was about Pip's taking responsibility and that that is a, is a great mistake in our own lives about growing up. That you're, you're, I mean, not you're not the center of the universe. I mean, even though you might have, you might acquire more power as you, you know, you have different relationships and everything. But uh, that's my main point anyway. So thank you very much. Take care. Well, let's let's connect that back to what Sarah was saying. The the fact that. Um, what Jaggers can do is lay people bare, find out things about people that uh, other people perhaps do not, or things that people are covering, right? What do we know, what need to know, what does he need to know about Drummle? Well, it seems from the, the scene, the scene, the dinner scene that he, uh, he makes a connection with Drummle, that he he senses whatever is lurking in 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 Bentley's personality, so that he has a as almost a sixth sense about that that he can sniff it out, and that uh, to his uh, according to his character, he completely dives in with it and uh, becomes almost obsessed with that one character. Well, I just want to tie this back one more thing. I mean, if we're also talking about Dickens' craft and how he does it, this sudden emphasis on Drummle and Jagger's interest in him, um, and we don't like Drummle, right, from the beginning. I mean, the way he's introduced and everything, we, we don't like the man. And he represents all of the ideas of um, propriety of the Victorian age, the false propriety kind of thing. And, and, and yet here we're spending this time. And so us as readers, we as readers, we, we know something's coming, right? There's something about this guy and we've got Jagger's hovering and so we we know something's up, David. Um, the legal system. Um, lawyers were divided into two types. There were solicitors, and those were people who did not appear in court. You went to them to make a will or transfer property or whatever. And then there are the people who do appear in court, uh, the pleaders, the counsel, and they also have variety. Dickens shows you different ones, including Sergeant Buzzfuzz and Pickwick. The lawyers who went to court were regarded as socially superior. They did not, uh, their clerk negotiated the fee, 
that the client was going to pay, but the lawyer was too important to handle cash. So they had a pocket sewed on the back of their silk court gowns. And if you were a client, you were supposed to dodge around and put the envelope with the cash into that pocket. Chaggers is a specialist. He's the guy you want to defend you if you're guilty as hell. There were people in, in this country who did that also in New York I, around 1900. I think it was a firm called Hummel and Howell. And if you were a crook, oh boy, did you want them. Uh, does that help? Yeah, but also remember that barristers uh, uh, are uh, in the system in England. Uh, barristers are um, have a clerk who decides who's going to have which case. Uh, and a, a smart Jaggers type lawyer is uh, going to want the lucrative. Um, Pressworthy kind of cases, so we can and so we can assume that one of the things that he's trying to do is sniff out where those things are. What are where? What are the skeletons in the closets, and how can he be um, at the right place in the right time, Sarah? You're muted, Sarah. Yeah, I just wanted to say about Drummel, what stood up for me is that uh, he tells Peep, it's okay to sing as you sing. You don't like Drummel, it's fine. Don't be influenced by the fact that I like him. Mm -hmm. Which mm -hmm. was also a good lesson, I thought. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. The, the, oh, there's a long ways to go with that too, isn't there, Peter? <laughs> Seems to me that Drummond is a gold digger, and if anything, then Jaggers is a gold digger. Jaggers is not a defense attorney at all. In fact, he will defend people and try to get them off. But what what mainly interested him is knowing their secrets so that he could rip them off for as much money as he can while he's trying to defend them. So and so he sees he sees the uh, opportunism in Drummond because Jaggers himself is the consummate opportunist. The, you know he doesn't give a shit about anybody, including his clients. <laughs> you know? uh, and uh, all he all he 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 he, he, uh, he seems to inspire fear in everyone. It's a it's a it's a kind of a double it's a double edged sword. It's like uh, he knows the worst about you. So you better get them on your side and you better pay up for it too. Yeah, you, know, you know what I mean? So it's that, that sort of, so he sees in Drummond that sort of opportunism that's like essentially basically what he is. You know, that's kind of how I, my take on it. And he doesn't care much about his house either. He only lives in a couple of rooms of it, right? And they're not particularly appealing either. David? You're muted, David. You're still muted, David. Okay. Disagreeing with Peter, who is usually correct on things, I don't think Jaggers is an opportunist. He's doing a job, detaches himself from it which is symbolized by his washing the hands after the client. There have been other people who did that. Thomas Dewey did. Uh, he's interested in Drummond because he recognizes someone who is a very likely future client. <laughs> Drummond is the sort of person who is very apt to do something criminal. 
yeah and as i said before that means we're, we're we we need to watch out right john yeah i i have both questions and a suggestion about jaggers and one question is that in in the novel if we sort of step back and think about pip and uh, his growing up process he he doesn't have a father but this is a book in which he has father figures so joe is a father figure um pumblechuck in a way is a father figure but jaggers is also a father figure or potentially a father figure so i think it would be interesting and useful to compare the various candidates for father figures. Um, Mr. Pocket, who's the tutor for Pip, is a minor father figure, but but he he's also one that we could add to this this group. And there may be others as well. But the thing about Jaggers, um, well, I, I have one other question about Jaggers, uh, which goes back to our discussion about being a gentleman and about social class. And I'm interested in the question of whether Jaggers is a gentleman or not. What it, the, If this novel is about what it means to be a gentleman, um, we need to measure whether various people meet that standard. But the standard is one that may differ in different cases. I mean, I, I think an argument could be made that Joe is a gentleman, for example, although he's not a gentleman in the conventional terms of social class and birth and rank in society and so on. So what about Jaggers? Is Jaggers a gentleman? Um, and in the world of law, Jaggers is clearly a barrister. Uh, he's someone who pleads cases and argues cases at law. And he has, like, like many barristers, a specialty, a, an area of specialization. And he is what we would today call loosely a criminal lawyer. Mm. But that, that term is a nicely ambiguous term because he is associated with criminality. Uh, his his specialty is the uh, is is cases that involve criminals, and I think he's interested in Bentley Drummle because he recognizes in Bentley Drummle a criminal type, yes. uh, and he he wants he has a professional interest in criminality, <laughs> yeah. uh, and and he has this particular skill that he exhibits both in, in the chapters we read for this uh, week or this month. Uh, he exhibits on two occasions. One is the dinner with Pip and Herbert and Drummle and Startop. And then he exhibits the same skill in the dinner that he has with uh, at Miss Havisham's with Sarah Pocket Estella Pip, and himself. And that ability is that without committing himself to saying anything, he is able to elicit in the other people in that social scene, that social setting, um, their true characters. That, uh, uh, and, and so he's able to bring out in them and observe with this kind of detached professional eye who they really are. They, they manifest themselves. And, and in, in social situations, you know, normally dinner parties, people are on their best behavior. But at a Jaggers, where there's a Jaggers dinner party, people are not on their best behavior. They're on their worst behavior, in a sense. Or if not always their worst behavior, they, they exhibit their true behavior, their true character. So I think that Jaggers has a kind of detached um, uh, 
perspective, a detached interest in bringing out the true nature of characters without revealing himself. Um, and that in that respect, he's like a novelist. That a novelist exhibits or explores, investigates, and brings out the true character of the figures, the characters in a, in a story um, by allowing them to reveal themselves. Robert Peel, when he started the Metropolitan London Metropolitan Police Department, hired uh, criminals to be policemen. And his logic was that they were the people who knew what, the most what criminals did. And I think that's, I'm agreeing with John here, that Jagger is, Jagger's is, and Sarah, uh, he's knows his turf he knows what to what to look for pat uh sure thank you this will be a little off the wall comment since i'm not a a charles dickens uh kind of official knowledgeable person but is it true that charles dickens really never creates an, a lawyer that uh, is a hero. <laughs> he he always he, he has an extreme dislike for lawyers. Is that not correct? <laughs> well, Shakespeare said, "Kill the lawyers." Right? <laughs> lawyers have not come off. I can't think of one. That's... Right. Mark Mark Twain does the same thing. I think he he has a a dislike for lawyers. Uh, I, what is it about? about uh novelists <laughs> and lawyers um i guess maybe they are often the victim of lawyers uh i don't know what that's about but jaggers when you see pictures depicted of jaggers and maybe online and current films or whatever jaggers has the tall hat <laughs> uh there uh, there's the uh the theory of the hat again and what it just what it portrays um a, a a gentleman it's a gentleman's picture but not necessarily gentlemanly i don't know that's all i have to say those are my theories good, good. peggy you're muted peggy there i'm just slow these days um i think the guy in A Tale of Two Cities, who was the guy from the bank, was a lawyer. Uh, no, um, Mr. Laurie. Laurie, can't yeah. Remember. I thought he's, he was a lawyer. Driver is a lawyer in A Tale of Two Cities. Yeah. 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 No, Laurie's not a not a lawyer. He, he's a banker. Yeah. Okay. Well, I got but, it wrong anyway. But in Sydney Carton, a lawyer? Nope. Well, I'm yes, not. he is. He is Sydney Park. So he's kind of he's kind of a hero. Yeah, but we're led to believe he's not. He's a drunk. He's a drunk. Yeah. I I, I would say in general, Dickens doesn't like the law, mm. and he doesn't like lawyers, but there are exceptions and. To come back to Jaggers, I I would ask, and this is you know that kind of simple-minded question: Is he a good guy or a bad guy? And in relation to Pip, is he a good father or a bad father? Good. Why? He's a good guy in relation to Pip. Explain. Well, he is trying to. Um show him what he should avoid i think or the kind show him things about the world that might be beneficial to him but i also want to point out that he, he, pip always calls him my guardian um uh, never anything else and i'm 
I'm not certain. I know that that is what Pip believes. And is he is he a good guardian? Is he guarding? He helps materially, but I would find him, if he were my guardian, I'd be very confused by <laughs> behavior. Yeah, well, I'd be confused by Mrs. Joe, too. Janet had something to say. Um, I don't, I would not call him a good guardian. No, I mean, he's, all he does is oversee the money and, you know, hand out as much, you know, make decisions as to how much money uh, Pip is allowed to have. But he does absolutely nothing to give Pip any kind of guidance for good, for ill, for anything else. And I, I tend to see Jaggers as not exactly malevolent, but it's like he's always on the sidelines waiting for people to screw themselves up. He's, mm -hmm. he's always looking for someone's weak spot can somehow take advantage of, but he never steps in to, to help. He just doesn't involve himself in any way. So I don't, I don't consider that being a good guardian in the way that we normally interpret that word as someone who's looking out for our interests. I don't think he's looking out for Pip at all. Um, well, hold this in your head. We have another guardian, right? Miss Havisham. She's not particularly a good one either. Okay, Sarah? Even worse. Yeah. I, I think there is a paragraph that uh, it, it gives a partial answer to that when uh, he comes back from his trip uh, to Mrs. Avisham and Estella, and he talks to Herbert and this, it tells him everything, like his fascination with Estelle. And then they talk about the expectation. There is a great expectation, but who defined it? There is a definition that Mrs. Avisham has and the Juggers has, and maybe a different one that Pip has. And he, he asks if the expectation is related to him marrying Estelle and doing what Mrs. Avisham wants him to do, love, 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 no matter what. Uh, and and uh, Herbert said that he talked about it with his father and his father said that Mr. Jagger would never take on an expectation that he cannot fulfill. So whatever, however the expectation is defined by Mr. Jagger, uh, uh, he'll, he'll do a good job to fulfill it. Good, good. Virginia? I would say I don't think Jaggers is a good example of a guardian at all. He is in it. He is only doing what's required. And he's going to let Pip dig a big hole to fall into before this is all over, I think, because he's letting him spend money like crazy on ridiculous things. He doesn't offer him really any advice. He just says, this is what you're allowed to do. Go ask, you know, Wemmel, uh, you know, for the money. Um, you can have whatever you want. He's letting him dig a hole. And I don't see Haversham as a guardian at all. She's just using him to set up her scheme with Estella. Um, you know, I think she has no interest in Pip as a person, as he's just a thing to her to use to, you know, amuse herself um, and toy with, uh, especially as regards Estella. So I don't see either of those being, you know, in a guardian position where they're trying to help Pip at all. Uh, and, and remember that Jaggers always is, uh, has these little caveats of, I'm going to do this, but I'm not going to do that. That's not part of my purview. He's got his, um, he knows his ropes. He knows what he's, what he is doing. David? Oh, uh, to defend Jaggers, <laughs> he's carrying out the instructions he's given by his client. Yeah. Uh, 
which his first obligation is to the client rather than to Pip. Uh, Miss Havisham is uh, is nastier because she's using Pip to torment her greedy relatives. She's allowing them to believe that her money is going to Pip because they gather around fawning on her and she wants to watch them suffer. Blair, did you have something to say? You started to. Yeah, I, I did. Going back to the subject of uh, lawyers and Dickens, um, we know that Dickens uh, drew from the people that he knew, that he met, maybe even characters he encountered on the street. Um, I am reminded of the fact that Dickens had an early job in Doctors Commons in a solicitor's office and wonder how many of the lawyers he uh, later used in his literature were patterned after attorneys that he met uh, when he was on the job in Doctors Commons. We, of course, have no way of really uh, uh, knowing this for sure, but it's just something that I wonder about. Just a comment. Yeah. Yeah, that it, certainly. If you've been on a court case for a while, goes on for a while, there's, you know, you could write lots of wonderful descriptions of the people that you see in those situations for sure. Clark? I just, we have to, we have to uh, pay a little attention to the housekeeper that Jaggers employs. Yes, that's one of the things that's on one of my slides that we haven't, we're not using, but any is um, it, what's another thing that we have to pay attention to is that um, Dickens in that chapter spends quite a lot of time uh, talking about Molly and we even have Pip saying, you know, she reminds me of somebody. And so, you know, that's another spoiler alert for, a, you know, cliffhanger or whatever you want to say for us that are reading it like we are reading it, because there is another shoe to drop about Molly, we're pretty sure, right? And uh, and that curious detail about the fact that she has these wrists, um, you know, your mind goes... Well, hmm. what do people do with their wrists that would make them stronger? Or, you know, in our modern world, we people lift weights, but that's probably not what it's talking about here, right? So, yeah, I, that's a really nice detail, I think. Um, Ava, could I just show a couple of my uh pictures just for fun see there go to the next one please there's a picture of a 19th century forge and i pulled that up because uh, it seems like this uh, joe's forge is a symbol of um you know happy symbol but the, this is certainly a, a dark place i think i had a blacksmith in my hometown and um it was always dark and you know the sparks would make soot and everything all over the place okay the next one uh wait we missed one go back one there we go this is Restoration House, which is in Rochester and Kent. And most people think this is the house that, um, sad, sadist house, that he used um, 
uh, as Miss Havisham's house. And I don't know about you, but uh, it, my imagination is much better than this. And it is restoration architecture, but um, I don't know. And then the next one, just for fun. Mm -hmm. And that's Bernard's in um, where, okay, no, we're not going to get to any of that. The in, ends of Chancery where uh, Joe goes to see Pip. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Any comments about those? You want to show the slide about home? Because I think that's a... Yeah, okay. That's a good slide. Raises lots of good yeah. questions. Yeah, these are the, the examples. And somebody, Kathleen, is that it? Mentioned early on in our discussion that he he has been introduced to all these um different homes and examples of homes um anybody want to jump in what are they like well the only one i would want to be in is wemix castle the rest of them are all <laughs> <laughs> pretty uncomfortable or unpleasant in one way or another yes the whole that whole scene with the aged parent and and uh stinger the the little cannon and that whole thing is that that's a very lovely section also um and back to dickinson's craft very carefully Dickens shows us this nice little homey place with the aged parent and all this. And then we see Wemmick in his public life and how much, how different he is when he is doing Jagger's dirty work. All right. What about Jagger's place? a place of cross-examination mm -hmm. mm -hmm. well what about the pockets house just one other thing about jagger's house is that he works from home as well as from the office he what? I think one could say that he is the part. You know, if Wemmick has two parts, the home person and the public person, Jaggers does not. Yes. He has his makeup. Jaggers' home, home is, a, is also his castle. Yes. Even though, as I said before, he doesn't use all of it, right? Which I find a very interesting detail. What about the Pockets House? Chaos. Chaotic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we could spend some time talking about Mrs. Pockets. Disease, which seems sort of thrown in there. Glenna? Um, I was just going to say, I think this is such a good way of looking at things. Because Dickens is one of our great literary, um, he has the capacity to characterize home. Uh, <clears throat> like I'm thinking of the Cratchit's home, which is humble, but it is such cozy domesticity. And you have, um, uh, what is it, uh, Jelly Bees in Bleak House, where that's chaos. <clears throat> uh, Dora's flaw is not knowing how to run at home. I mean, Dickens gives you such a range of humble, but cozy, disorderly, cold, forbidding. <clears throat> I mean, it's absolutely astonishing, um, which I say, virtuosity in the way he displays homes. 
And I think this is just great to think about this theme in relationship to great expectations. Yeah, me too. Margaret? Yes, to go back to Pocket's house, it's really interesting how the servants are in control of everything there. It seems even the finances for who gets what at the dinner table and, and Pip's observations that it's better to be down in the kitchen than anywhere else in the house. So, but I, I'd like to, to bring up the, uh, the question of money and how money defines the gentleman. I mean, that seems to be the first thing in, in, in Jagger's list. After all, he controls the money that Pip is getting, the, the allowances, and he's given, he gives Pip the chance to learn something by being, by Pip's being a spendthrift and Jagger's is observing him and seeing how that will, where that will get him as, as Jagger's would know from his life experiences of observation. And that uh, that's a subject that I think that we should cover in, uh, in other meetings, if not if a little bit now, about money being the big decider for who is a gentleman. For example, with, uh, with Drummle, uh, he is uh, second in line for a title. And uh, so he has great expectations also. But uh, the great expectations that Pip has, the one of the, the, the main great expectations is that uh, he will come into more money, that there will be more. He asks for more, there'll be more. So that's what I'd like us to discuss as time goes on. What a uh, how money is is the decider in so many things, like what sort of house you have, what you can afford, and what is it. But also in the forge, like what is enough for you? It's enough for uh, for Joe to have that house, to be in that house, even with uh, his wife, Mrs. Joe, and by the name of the. Uh, Miss Avisham's house, Sati's house, it means enough. And we can explore why it was called that. And another other observation about that house is that it, it's, it's red brick and it has the business right attached to it. So it must have had the smell of the brewing all throughout her childhood and all throughout her great expe expectations too. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sarah? Uh, just uh, regarding the pockets house, I thought that Herbert summarized it nicely when he told Pip that he's going to get married and all his sisters except the baby are going to get married. And he said, when you grow, somehow when you grow up in a messed up house, you want to get married very quickly. <laughs> and, and find his uh, uh, looking about himself. That's a great one too. There's so much to uh, to talk about. Well, let's just, it's time to quit, but Pip and Herbert's room, what's kind of the theme going there? They've got this unusual servant and an, enough furniture, right? To kind of do Oh, a few things. That's very, very curious. A bit like a dorm room. Well, I think I think we could talk more about the various homes, and this is a useful diagram for for doing that. Uh, the only home, perhaps, that's missing is Pip's original home with Mrs. Joe and Joe. But that's really an adjunct of the forge. Got the forge there, yes. The, the, the forge, like, like so many uh, businesses in the 19th century, was attached to the residence. Uh, it was only as you moved up the social class that uh, the office is at a different location. That's, of course, the, the case with Jaggers, but as we've said, Jaggers takes the business home. And so his home is not really so much a home as it is an extension of the, um, of the, of the business. It's interesting but, 
interesting we're going back to that right there are so many new mm -hmm. areas where they're building uh apartments above and businesses below not exactly. necessarily connected that way though but i think we should bring today's session to a close and we should thank barb for leading us through this section of great expectations and so i'm grateful to you barb and uh, uh i i hope you'll all applaud and join uh us yeah. again next month yeah thank you thank you thank you barb <laughs>